And so uh, without further ado, we've got Jim here. Um, and I'll do a quick introduction and then I'll turn it over to you, Jim. Okay. Sounds uh, good. So, <laughs> so Jim's an amateur historian and enthusiast for military aviation. And he's done a lot of research on planes, military aircraft that had flown in and around the Rome area. Um, and so tonight, the program is going to be uh, telling, telling stories and accidents and incidents of planes that connect back to the central New York area. And Jim's presentation tonight has photographs from the Rome Historical Society's collection. Uh, so that's exciting to have him uh, presenting those photographs and, and talking us through what can be seen in those photographs. Um, all right, Jim, I'm going to hand it over to you and you let me know. I'll start sharing your presentation now. Okay. And you can take it away. Right, very good. Thank you, Miranda. Um, it's nice to be on this side of the camera instead of the other side. Uh, I used to do what uh, Miranda's doing. <laughs> so it's <laughs> nice to, to have somebody who's going to uh, shepherd things. Uh, so what we'll do is when I, when I say next, Miranda, you'll just... Uh, hit the next uh, slide. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, let me start by saying that um, this is by no means a perfect presentation. There's a lot of things that have happened uh, over the years and everybody is, they, is history. If you look at the name history, it's his story or could be her story. So uh, I'm always uh, open to corrections, amplifications, and, and other things. Um, but I thought it would be great to at least start this out. By the way, this is Airplane Tales 1. I have number two is all ready to go, and number three I'm working on. So there's, there's enough information out there, and the good folks at the Rome Historical Society uh, have said that they'd be willing to let me pause through through some things. So uh, not all of this is specifically Griffiths or, or Rome Army Airfield, but there's quite a bit of connection to Central New York. So next, please, Miranda. The first, the first story I came across was the story of Hot Stuff, uh, B-24, that was actually the first uh, bomber to do 25 missions. Um, but what happened was, uh, and let's put this into historical context, the, uh, uh, the concept of daylight precision bombing was a new theory that uh, was being proven by the group that became known as the Bomber Mafia, uh, who were we're trying to go with a theory of uh, strategic bombing as a as a concept. Uh, the The case of uh, hot stuff was that this B twenty four, and you'll notice that what we're going to zero in on is a couple of things here. There's uh, Frank Andrews, Lieutenant General Frank Andrews, who's in the upper right hand corner, but there's also uh, Kenneth Jeffers, who was the engineer and radio operator, excuse me, radio operator uh, of that hot stuff. So next, if you could, please, Miranda. Uh, so Sergeant Jeffers was from Ariscity Falls, New York, and a lot of these circumstances uh, relate some way back to central, central New York. Next. Okay, so the, the uh, hot stuff was assigned to the 330th Bomb Squadron, the 93rd Bomb Group, uh, 8th Air Force. It was uh, arguably the first uh, plane to fly 25 bombing missions over Europe, mm -hmm. uh, and it actually achieved that several weeks before the famed Memphis Bell did. Uh, and so what happened was um, not only was the hot stuff one of the ones to do it, but uh, in the Memphis Bell got uh, the honors, among other 
among other notable planes, Hell's Angels from the 303 bomb group. But you have to look at this in terms of what was selling propaganda-wise at the time in the United States in the war effort. Uh, it was deemed that um, Hell's Angels would not necessarily be appropriate. So that's why everybody kind of liked the, uh, the love story between um, Bob Morgan and his, and his then girlfriend in um, 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 Memphis. So, uh, but the first crew to actually do this, next please, was, um, was on its way back for a bond tour. And like so many other things, what happened was the, uh, the regular crew got bumped because Lieutenant General Frank Andrews, and you'll know the name from Andrews uh, Air Force Base, um, he was coming back to U from Europe, and I, they think the thought was that he was going to be honored and or given a new assignment. And a lot of his entourage uh, bumped crew members um, from the flight. So next. Unfortunately, what happened was hot stuff did not stop to refuel at Presswick in Scotland on their way back to the States. They pressed on to uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, um, and when they got there, the weather was extremely bad. Uh, as a result uh, of the bad weather and, uh, and other mishaps, they unfortunately crashed into the side of a mountain, and I'm not going to insult Icelandic speakers um, by trying to pronounce the name of that mountain, but that's, that's where the accident happened that took care of hot stuff. Uh, and the only person to survive next was um, a sergeant, the gun, the tail gun uh, is perhaps one of the few times a tail gunner was in a good um, situation, a sergeant ISIL was the only one to survive there. I've seen pictures of the uh, ceremony, the burial ceremony for uh, General Andrews. He no doubt was a rising star in the Army Air Corps and would have, we would probably know him for many other things at this point had he not been killed in this accident. And again, here's a picture of his tombstone. He's buried uh, in Ariskany Falls, the Hillside Cemetery. Next. Uh, the next story is a truly interesting one here as well. This is Pistol Ball. Um, Pistol Ball, and there's the serial number of the plane itself. And it a, was a very storied veteran. Uh, it's an F model. And excuse me if I go a little wonky here uh, in terms of what things are, uh, are mentioned. But the, uh, it was part of the 351st Bomb Group uh, in Polbrook, England. Um, and you're not, you're not seeing wrong there in the center shot. And in the right shot there is Clark Gable. And he did a lot, served a lot of time with the, uh, with the, the 351st and a, a couple of other units. And he enlisted in the Army Air Corps upon uh, the death of his wife, Carol Lombard, who was killed stateside in an airplane crash, um, putting, going to a, um, going to a bond drive. So uh, uh, that's the unit. Uh, and actually on the far left is an actual picture of pistol ball uh, back in the day during the war. As you can see, it's one of the, it's an F model, no chin guns on, under it. So it's an earlier version of the, of the plane. And for those of you who may not know, the, uh, there's a lot can be told by the serial number on the plane. And that's what I use to do between the personnel names I can search, but also the uh, serial number of the plane gives me a lot of um, uh, places to, uh, to, to look for information. Next, please. Um, the, uh, the the 351st was a part of what they call the ball boys. Uh, each, many of the planes, I know that all the planes 
were had some kind of ball in the name, foul ball, screw ball, meatball, um, spitball, and uh, the uh, uh, pistol ball was uh, was uh, one of the planes, and that was originally flown by uh, Mr. Uh, Lieutenant Wilson. Um, so uh, he was the original pilot of, uh, of pistol ball. Next. So this brings us to the story of what, how Central New York gets involved. And a lot of these older planes were brought back stateside for training purposes. Um, one of the interesting things I've noticed is that when guys took a new plane overseas, when they were deployed to Europe, it's interesting that when they got to their stations, um, a lot of a lot of them were kicked out of these new planes and they were given the oldest planes uh, to fly and they gave the newer planes to the seasoned troops. Um, so this, where it's now at the end of 19, or it's 1945, it's uh, pistol ball has, has done its time and is back here. And it's going from um, Stewart Air Force Base, which is in uh, Orange County, uh, actually Newburgh, which I think is Ulster, actually. Um, there was a presentation done by Matt Ertz, who's the Madison County historian. Um, and this is, this is how it ties to Central New York. Um, next, please. What happened was they were coming in from uh, that part of the woods up here, got disoriented somehow, and remember that flying is a, at best a dangerous occupation. Um, and they got turned around in the weather. They got some false readings from some places that they thought they were, that turns out they weren't. Long story short, they ran low on fuel and uh, the uh, it was a training mission and the lieutenant uh, of the uh, of the the pilot Alfred Kramer, uh, you know, said, "Okay, guys, you can bail out if you want." Uh, unfortunately, what happened? There was a bombardier named uh, Lieutenant Blanky, um, who had flown, you know, more than fifty missions in Europe. Uh, he was unfortunately the first one to bail out. His chute didn't open, and he turned out to be the only casualty. Uh, uh, seven other passengers did bail out successfully, and the plane went down in Nelson, New York, which is in southern Madison County, uh, right around Casanova. Um, I did not hear about this um, incident, uh, and I come from a very storied family in World War II air information, so this was a real find for me. Next. Um, and then before they were able to locate a second field, they were believed they had alternate. They were alternating to alternating to uh, Rome. Uh, Kramer gave the word to bail out. Um, and uh, next, please. And they, he decided to stay, and his co-pilot decided to stay with the plane. Um, and it put down, <laughs> crash landed. Uh, belly up or wheels up uh, around Casanova and the survivors made their way to the Nelson Inn. There were some, there were some injuries. Uh, they were treated by a local uh, doctor um, in the, you know, there's accounts of the state police cordoned off the area. Next please. Uh, here's some photographs that uh, did not come from, from uh, the Historical Society, but uh, were provided in the presentation that Matt Ertz did. And it shows clearly a rear view of the, on the left of the of a pistol ball. And on the right is the forward section of, uh, of, the, of the plane. Next please. And some other shots here, as you can see, uh, uh, this is what happens when skinny aluminum meets solid surfaces. <laughs> uh, next, please. Uh, this is a picture that was taken uh, of the interior of Pistol Ball. 
And this gives you an idea of the world. Picture on the right is an actual pristine uh, view of that same picture in the upper left. It's the basically the uh, area that housed the ball turret, um, and the uh, it's looking forward uh, to the ra the radio room would be beyond that bulkhead, and of course the machine guns, the waste guns, right and left were in the picture there. So it gives you an idea of what what we were looking at. Next, please. And this is where the plane crashed. If you and I apologize that this isn't the greatest shot, but this gives you. Route 20 is uh, beautiful downtown Nelson is there. And as you can see at about 11 o'clock to that point, you see the crash site and there different pieces of the plane wound up in different places. So gives you a reference. Uh, next. And that's an actual aerial view. And the red spot, the red dot indicates, and it's still farmland where the plane crashed. Uh, next, please. When I went to the presentation at Casanova Library that uh, that uh, Matt did, the, all the guys, it turns out, had signed a piece of silk from one of the uh, parachutes. And so it was a, to commemorate uh, things in typical aviation uh, <laughs> humor there. One jump Saunders, navigate. <laughs> so everybody got a chance to sign uh and I don't know how they got it. They must have, the locals obviously took care of the uh, the airmen. So they must have just left uh, stuff behind, memories and, and that sort of thing. You see some dog tags and flight wings and things like that. Next, please. All right. The next story is uh, of uh, Marine Lieutenant uh, Robert Hollis, who's from Oneida. It turns out that Bob... Um, was come was coming home after just after the war. He had uh, he had qualified as a pilot um, and was flying his Corsair. He was a member of the uh, 91st uh, Group, uh, 9th uh, Marine Air Wing, uh, VMF uh, nine excuse me nine twelve, and he and a buddy were flying up from Cherry Point. Uh, his buddy was going to break off and go to, the plan was break off and go uh, to, to Buffalo. Uh, and then uh, Bob was going to head to Rome Airfield um, and surprise his parents on the occasion of their 32nd wedding anniversary. Next, please. Um, he, at about 1.45 in the afternoon that day on September 24th, um, he indicated he was having engine trouble and, uh, you know, things got worse from there. Uh, the plane never showed, uh, at Rome, uh, search was conducted over the Catskill mountains, which was the last time that he and Lieutenant White were in touch with each other. Um, but the, uh, again, the Corsair never showed, um, he, the Lieutenant White made it safely to Buffalo, and then he was reassigned to uh, direct the search, uh, help with the search uh, of his of his compatriot. Next, please. Um, the Unfortunately, what happened was um, a year later, uh, hunters uh, found, and these are actual current day pictures of the remains of the, uh, the plane itself. Uh, it designated the Navy uh, FG-92527 um, Corsair. Um, and it's kind of interesting for me because I live in Oneida. Uh, his parents, Charles and Ida Hollis on Carpenter Street, actually mailed circulars throughout the North Country asking residents, you know, to search their farms. They were offered reward um, for any information and, and, and things like that. Next, please. Nope. Oh, okay. And there's actually a guy, and I, I've got his name in my records here, um, but he's actually spends his time among, among he, I think he's a forester, 
and he spends time doing uh, seeking out wrecks of all from all time periods. Um, but here he is uh, actually at the site of the uh, of the Fort Corsair. Um, there were four hunters who found um, uh, Hollis's body. They found the plane. They found his body, and they made positive identification because amongst the personal effects were a wallet. A check made out to him, and of course the remains of 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 him um, in his body. So next, please. And uh, here's um, there's the name of the hunters uh, that were that found him. Uh, I was able to get a couple of things. A picture of Bob uh, from his senior yearbook, uh, senior picture in the yearbook, I and mean, it's ironic. I love life was what he had put down. I managed to uh, <clears throat> find a, uh, his his uh, tombstone is at St. Francis Cemetery in Durnville, which is just north of Oneida. Next, please. Uh, here's some more information about him. Um, and as you can see there, uh, they found some money, uh, a check made out to him in his wallet. And one of the interesting things, if anybody really wants to get into things uh, deeply, is if you belong to Ancestry, um, you can search uh, things like uh, draft cards and other memorabilia. Uh, Bob was married uh, in May of 45, um, and his wife applied when he was found to be uh, dead. Uh, for the special uh, head, uh, headstone or marker. So uh, next, you can get a lot of information that way. This is when they found his body. There was a special funeral cortege in Oneida uh, at St. Joseph's Church, was at, which is on the north side. Um, the gentleman that's in the front there is Frank Nemetti who was in the Marines. There was a whole honor guard that were Marines that were assembled. Um, I knew Frank Nemetti. I actually went to school with his, one of his daughters, and he was a fixture around town for years. So, And <clears throat> Joe Arnold is one of the honorary pallbearers, and my brother-in-law is named Joe for Joe Arnold. So there's a little bit of, you know, you get out in this neck of the woods, everybody knows everybody else. Uh, next, please. Uh, next one is a, a family situation. My wife um, is a McNamara, and her uncle was uh, a pilot, B-29 pilot. Um, and um, there he, there's Charles on the left. I'm not sure who the little kid is. I think that's one of his. And on the right is his is his plane McNamara's band. Uh, and this is on taking on Tinian with both the air crew and the ground crew. Next, please. Um, he was one of five boys in the Winfield family. Um, and um, he enlisted at age 18. Um, he was in the Air Corps by uh, 44 and at uh, Walker Airfield in B-29 transition training. And he is in that picture, the back row extreme left. Uh, next, please. Uh, here's the ground crew uh, of uh, the city of uh, Jersey City. The uh, interesting thing about the city, of, uh, about the, the plane, it was one of 220 um, B-29s that were named for various cities throughout the country. It took me a long time to figure out. I could not find any records about McNamara's band. And it was my father, before he died, he actually came across uh, records of McNamara's band. The pilots were able to, <coughs> pardon me, were able to name their planes on the, uh, on the left side of the plane. Uh, but the right side of the plane, neither the co-pilot Eleanor Roosevelt came up with a concept of naming the um, the planes for various cities during a bond drive. Plus, she did not like the fact that a fair number of planes had scantily clothed ladies or uh, 
or some off uh, off colored comments. And but it was this this was their plane was the city of Jersey City. Um, and uh, footnote here. Uh, I, in my next program, I will be talking about uh, B-29s a little bit more because I'll be talking about uh, a gentleman who actually was responsible for maintaining the engines on the Enola Gay. So that'll be something to, uh, to whet your appetite in the future. Next, please. Um, here is uh, some info on it. There's the tail number. It was uh, designation <coughs> K-13. Um, and then there's, there's another surviving plane um, that's in a museum. I'm not sure exactly where that one is. There aren't too many surviving B-29, so it can't be too far. Um, next. <coughs> Some interior shots. The B-29 was a very complicated plane for its time. Upper left-hand corner is the engineer station. Uh, bottom left is the bomb bay. Um, the, um, the tail gunner position in the center. And then on the upper right there is a blister for fire control. There were several pilots, or excuse me, several gun, site, gun locations were directed by just one or two people. So a very advanced um plane for its time and unfortunately that presented some problems uh among other things the they had a nasty tendency to overheat because components in the engine were made of magnesium and has a nasty tendency to burn badly when, when it catches fire so next please and this is the <coughs> the greenhouse, uh, this is the pilot station on the left, co-pilot on the right, and in the nose is the, uh, is the bombardier. So this was Charles uh, McNamara's office, so to speak. <laughs> Next. This is the, uh, the, the, the tune that was done by, I guess the words were by Seamus O'Connor and sung by... Uh, I guess uh, uh, Bing Crosby um, did that, and I won't uh, I won't insult your ears by by trying to read to try to sing it. But that's uh, uh, the thing. The connection with Charles was he was a trumpet player, so that's how he came across that. <coughs> Next, please. They were part of the 314th Bomb Group and the 330th. Excuse me, Bomb Wing and the 330th bomb group. So there's some, some remaining uh, memorabilia from, from that time. Next. Uh, they were located on Tinian, North Field. <coughs> and uh, if you look in the upper left-hand corner of that um, layout there, you can see where the, three, the 330th bomb group was with the square K. Um, and then I had some other shots that show um, that group insignia, and there's some where they're flying over the field. Uh, it was basically a big, a big runway in the Pacific. Next, um, interesting. As I said, the B-29 was very advanced for his time. There was very little beta testing that happened. A lot of the uh, bugs had to be worked out. Uh, because we were at war, uh, and this was, I thought, a couple an interesting shot. This is a picture of the of the runway, and uh, it's interesting. This is I'm going to read you just briefly. I'm going to cherry pick pieces of it here, uh, uh, describing the runway. And of course, the planes were always overloaded and, and overgassed, and you knew every eye in the flight line was watching from every hard stand position, from every maintenance dock. Uh, the next ship in line was already cranking up full power, <coughs> excuse me, before you broke ground. Um, but, uh, but by now you were part of the point of thumps and bumps in the gear. Um, you had no choice um, 
and everybody kind of was holding their breath to make sure that uh, you could get off the ground. <clears throat> There's a great quote by uh, Curtis LeMay. You know, the B-29s had as many bugs as the entomological department at the Smithsonian. And uh, fast as they got the bugs licked, new ones crawled out from the colony. So it was very much a learn-as-you-go scenario. Next, please. Um, this was uh, the reason for Iwo Jima uh, was because it was halfway from uh, Guam Tinian Islands uh, to the mainland to attack Japan. Uh, it was uh, 1,500 miles one way. I've heard read accounts of um, <clears throat> missions that took 15 hours. Um, and the reason for taking this, uh, what was described as uh, island of hell, uh, because of the sulfur content in the ground, was because there was no place to... Uh, to land a, a, a B-29 if something happened. And so the thought was at least if you put a waste, the halfway station, you could at least recover some of those planes um, from total uh, annihilation. That of course saved the lives of the pilots as well. So this is a very, and that's a picture I was able to get of, of one of the uh, planes from the 330th uh, on, on uh, Iwo Jima. Next. Uh, this is Charles's plane. Uh, a couple of things here. There's Charles up on the top of the engine uh, with, a, with a maintenance person. <clears throat> the picture on the right uh, is notable for the fact that it's painted black. At first, I thought this was something that was done uh, late Korea, uh, but it turns out that having read several accounts, they were not getting anywhere with high-level strategic bombing. So Curtis LeMay, who was fresh off his time in Europe as a group commander, uh, they came up with the idea of uh, basically incendiary bombs, bombing, low level, go in, get it done, uh, and they went in at night, which was, again, antithetical to all of the things that... Uh, that people had put forward in the, in the bomber mafia. So that's kind of an interesting read to hear about incendiary devices, but the black was to obviously discourage searchlights by the Japanese air defense. Next. <clears throat> and here they flew 28 missions. Uh, there's the tail of his plane uh, taken by a buddy over Mount Fuji. Uh, and then there, there's the crew getting some sort of commendation. Next. He went on to serve in Korea. This is an unfortunate part of a lot of these guys' story at that point was they got called up to go back in to service. Eventually, he got out, uh, worked in the aerospace industry in California, and there's a picture of his, uh, of his plaque stone, uh, died in 92. Next. Okay, the next story is of uh, Don Cunningham. When I was a kid, um, my folks rented and eventually bought property from uh, Anna and Leonard Cunningham. And I always heard stories about how Don was uh, lost uh, at sea, uh, but he was a member of the Air Corps. And I was trying to figure out what happened. So one of the things that I did want to put this together was, and we're good family friends with both the Cunninghams and the Kinsellas. Um, and, uh, and I want to thank uh, Rick and Rob Kinsella for their uh, information that they provided. <clears throat> but uh, Don, um, and there's a, there's a picture of him as a navigator and uh, in a senior class picture uh, from uh, 1939, I believe. Next, um, he is the, was the son of uh, Anna and uh, Leonard Cunningham, and they ran, among other things, a dairy um, out on uh, south of Oneida on West Road, and uh, 
Leonard was actually uh, a volunteer ambulance corps in the First World War, and because a lot of his family members were enlisted into the Second World War, he actually, at a very relatively senior age, um, enlisted and re-enlisted himself and wound up as a CB in the South Pacific. Next. Uh, this is the, the B-17. This, is, this was Don Cunningham's uh, office, if you will. Uh, this is a picture of Fuddy Duddy, which for a while flew out of uh, Elmira um, and uh, was part of the Geneseo crew there for a while. This is a upper right is a shot coming from um, the, uh, the Bombay area forward <clears throat> to the, uh, uh, you can see the navigator spot on the Navigator station on the left, and of course, the bombardiers uh, station right in the nose there with the infamous uh, Norden bomb site. Below is the picture of the navigator station with all the, st the state of the art stuff there. Um, and uh, you can see all the things that all the items that the navigator had at his disposal for finding um, where they were. I can tell you that. Uh, it was a fairly primitive uh, practice at that point, and um, a lot of the equipment wasn't necessarily trustworthy. Uh, there were a lot of problems with some of the technology at that point. Um, and the other thing that happened was everybody wanted to be in the Air Corps, and you were either wanted to be a pilot or um, – and a lot of those guys couldn't, for whatever reason, maybe they were colorblind or maybe they weren't quite right uh, temperamentally for it, washed out of pilot training and became navigators, bombardiers, that sort of thing. Um, next. Um, Don, uh, again, was part of this crew. And uh, the story was they, started, they set out on December 9th uh, from Goose Bay. Uh, they never arrived uh, in the UK. The last known position of them was uh, 450 miles uh, from uh, Iceland. There were some other, there was at least in one other upstate New Yorker in that, and that was uh, Lieutenant Oren Burke, who's from the Olean area, uh, Chautauqua County. Um, next. <clears throat> And the pilot was quite an experienced pilot, um, Captain George Bush. Um, and they were all, many of them were part of the ferry group, uh, ferry group being the folks that brought planes and personnel over to Europe um, and back from Europe, <coughs> excuse me, um, during the war. Uh, it was a very risky business at best. Next. Um, the navigators, there's a, I figured it'll be interesting for you to see the air transport, uh, ferry service, uh, insignia, the, uh, wings that the pilots had, or excuse me, the navigators had. Um, and then I thought it was interesting that, uh, in 1942-43, uh, I guess a number of bulletins were put out that said, if you get a two engine aircraft, you're not, you are forbidden from flying <laughs> the great north um, route transportation wise. You needed at least a four engine plane, and even that was uh, quite dangerous. Next. Uh, the plane itself, uh, there's a little bit of nomenclature about it. They carried crew, but they also carried some folks. Uh, to uh, the uh, to Europe. Um, there's a picture that is not a B twenty. That's not a B seventeen. I think that's just a transport plane. Um, but it gives you an idea of the primitive conditions that a lot of people had when they were going over or coming back from um, overseas. And I read a book called Everything But the Flak by Martin Caden. 
<clears throat> which is a story of three planes that were flown over to Europe <clears throat> for the making of the Steve McQueen movie, The War Lover. Um, and as the name says there of the book, everything but the flag. And they tell some harrowing, Martin Caden gives some harrowing accounts of what it was like to go across the Atlantic. And there's never a good time weather-wise to go across the Atlantic. Next. Um, again, weather. Here's some shots of, of the type of things that you would come up against. Obviously, snow, uh, thunderstorms, uh, polar air masses, uh, all the worst basic parts of the of the Old Testament, so to speak, except for uh, <clears throat> except for locusts. Next, uh, there's a really good uh, account of this. In the uh, in a book that I read tw called Twelve Minutes by Ralph Graham, and it, it's sort of a narrative of things. Everything went well until the early morning hours when we could not or would not be able to call go back to uh, Goose Bay, <clears throat> and we're at the point of no return. Time passed slowly. Our pilot became anxious, <clears throat> and often he called. <clears throat> the navigator for the assurance that we were on course. Uh, the fuel be also became a concern. The pilot's voice became more and more tense, occasionally wavering. And it go, he goes on to talk about how when they finally saw land and knew they were close, that everybody breathed easy. So it's kind of interesting account. Next. <clears throat> and here show, this shows the... Uh, a couple of things. It shows the people on that flight. Uh, the third name down is uh, Cunningham. And it shows the five crew members as well as the five passengers. Uh, and as you can see from that picture in the upper right, <clears throat> you start out in the States. You work your way through Canada. You go to Greenland. You go to Iceland. And then you come down to, uh, to uh, Scotland. <clears throat> and then eventually you can. Next. Uh, and this is a memorial stone that was put uh, in Oneida at the Glenwood Cemetery to commemorate uh, the memory of uh, Lieutenant Don Cunningham. Next. Uh, the next person is the Lieutenant George Kinsella. <clears throat> and again, my thanks to the... Uh, the family of uh, the Kinsellas and the Cunninghams for providing information about this. George was a uh, navigator, and he was a part of the uh, 15th Air Force, uh, the 463rd Bomb Group. George also uh, had had three planes out taken out from underneath him. Um, so he uh, he joined the Caterpillar Club a couple of times. Uh, next, please. Different positions on the plane, I won't go into them, um, but obviously you had the four officers, a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier. Next, uh, you had the enlisted positions, which were largely gunner and uh, radio operator and uh, a flight mechanic, um, who was usually a senior uh, and most knowledgeable flight engineer. <clears throat> Next, please. Um, here's a picture of George uh, in his position upper left corner with his flak uh, jacket on in the navigator's position. This was one of the planes he flew on, the Mary Lou, uh, again, 15th Air Force. Next. And uh, here's the, another one, Abel Mabel. Now, Abel Mabel uh, was the plane that... Um, <clears throat> that he eventually was was shot down in over Yugoslavia. Next, please. And just to give you an idea, there's a there's a cross section of the plane of the B-17 and how you're supposed to bail out of it. Uh, bottom left is a uh, Western Union telegram uh, saying that unfortunately, you know, George is missing in action. Upper right-hand corner is an escape map that was often stitched into their flight jackets so that you had a reference point. 
And uh, I got to tell you, of all the places I would want to be in, probably the South Pacific jungle and the mountainous mountains of Yugoslavia were would be two bad places to be. Next. <clears throat> um, he uh, apparently eventually wound his way out, and there are several accounts that the, the, the his sons have of the harrowing experiences they had going between partisan groups in Yugoslavia. There's a pic there is a uh, picture of this Western Union telegram saying, I'm okay. I kind of included this as, uh, as a kind of a curious uh, curiosity I came across. Uh, upper right hand there, back row, second person in is Sterling Hayden who we know as, well, he was, he's Sterling Hayden in movies, uh, but where is he here? He is uh, uh, Captain John Hamilton. He was involved in in getting many downed flyers through the, the precursor to the uh, CIA, the uh, OSS, and the SOE, the British thing. So I thought that was kind of, Interesting, Sterling Hayden, for those of us cinephiles who maybe are into older movies. Next. Um, these are some escape routes. A lot of civilians uh, risk, literally risk their lives getting down flyers out. This does not happen to be Yugoslavia, the, the Baltic states, but this is just give you an idea of some of the, the uh, uh, escape routes. Next. And here is George got called back in <laughs> in the service, and he was a navigator um, during the uh, during the uh, Korean War. There's a picture of the stone next, and this is how I know George Kinsella. The upper right hand corner, first person standing is Doctor George Kinsella, M.D. He was my family doctor when I was a kid, so. Uh, Small world. Next, please. All right, so here we go. I've teased you long enough. Um, going to get to some of the, a little bit more specifically Rome. And there's a nice panoramic shot of, uh, of the old air base or airfield at the time. And um, the, uh, the when it was under construction, and of course, uh, the historical society has done a fantastic job of promoting um, the building of the of the base, and I and, and I'm sure we'll have more information available to you. Um, the uh, you'll notice there's a B-17 there named Genevieve. And uh, next, please. Uh, right hand corner is an article, and I want to I want to give a shout out to Gary Panzer. Uh, of Oneida, who actually showed me this um, article about Genevieve, which was, as you can see right there, it was the first airplane repaired by the Rome Air Depot. Um, and um, what this did was oftentimes when you get these stories, it you pull a string and you get more stories uh, out of it. Hey, hey, thank Gary. <laughs> um, the um, the story behind Genevieve is that uh, she was quite the uh, she was quite the plane. She started out uh, as a member of the 306 um, group um, out of and was flown out of Syracuse. Had an accident and wound up repaired. Uh, at uh, at Rome, um, Bill Prentice was the first pilot when he did a he had a forced landing um, in in October in Rome. Um, it's too bad that uh, that uh, Bill Prentice didn't stay with um, with uh, Genevieve because she. Uh, because uh, he wound up getting shot down and killed, unfortunately, in um, in action uh, in flying a plane called Cherry. Uh, the 306 bomb group, by the way, is the bomb group for uh, Staff Sergeant Snuffy 
uh, Maynard Snuffy Smith. Um, so that's how you, those of you who may know these things uh, might, uh, might be aware of that. Uh, next. But what truly came of interest to me was the story of uh, Nancy Harkness Love, who was the uh, was the WASP pilot that was tasked with uh, taking um, the uh, Genevieve, for who had seen quite a bit of action, um, and taking it to retirement, if you will, at Amarillo. Um, and I just want to do a little bit of reading for you here. Uh, one of the least publicized facets of work that pilots had, ferry pilots had to do, was to uh, relocate war weary airplanes. Um, in October 16, 1944, Nancy Love and B.J. Erickson picked up a beat up 17 in Patterson Field in Dayton, Ohio. They were assigned to ferry it to Amarillo, Texas. It was uh, when they got inside the plane, grease and oil stained the concrete under each engine. The ship was dirty and much patched, uh, but they found out it had a very proud heritage. And on the instrument panel on the pilot side, they found a plaque that says, and this is the plaque that I just showed you in the previous slide, Genevieve, first airplane repaired by the Rome Air Depot, Please advise of her escapades. Uh, they, uh, Love and Erickson, realized they had a very special uh, plane here. Um, <clears throat> but just as soon as they started the engines up, three out of four engines immediately gave problems. Number four poured oil. Um, no, and then, let's see here, the repairs uh, took most of the afternoon. Um, the, they had continued problems. When they got near St. Louis, uh, they came across uh, a flight squadron of P-47s who whizzed by the pilots, laughed at them, and made gestures from their cockpits, uh, indicating women drivers. And, uh, and ever-increasing vibrations in engine number one caused concern. They reduced power, uh, and they finally made it into Amarillo, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately, Genevieve uh, was going to meet her fate. But they, uh, Nancy Harkness uh, Love says, <clears throat> we became very fond of her. We felt a certain spiritual kinship with her since we share a common and ignominious fate being bound for our figurative grave on December 20th, 1944. The wasps were inactive. So that was from an actual account of uh, uh, from from a book that was written by Sarah Rickman, Nancy Love, and the Ferry Pilots of World War II. So I, I thought you guys might enjoy hearing, hearing that. Next, please. <clears throat> and of course, this is where uh, Genevieve wound up in Amarillo. Next. And we're getting there, so bear with me a little bit here. Uh, uh, other things I found out at Griffiths, or excuse me, Rome Airfield, uh, Old Hellcat uh, was a B-26 that, uh, that came to visit on a bond drive, encouraging the folks to continue to repair the planes and the war effort and that sort of thing. Um, and again, these are some, some of this that you're going to see are pictures provided by the Rome Historical Society. Um, there's a copy of the program that was made for the day. <coughs> Next, please. And uh, again, this is uh, bottom left is a picture of a reception that was done. This was carried in all the all the places. The old Hellcat was the first uh, B-26, which was a tactical bomber, um, to complete 50 missions, uh, largely in the Mediterranean. And I thought it would be kind of fun to put in some pictures there about uh, women who were impressed into the service and volunteered to, uh, to work uh, on planes and repairing planes at uh, Rome Airfield. Next. Uh, 
Uh, some more of the B-26s, upper left-hand corner is Old Hellcat. Uh, above right there is uh, Coffin Coffee. Co Coffee's Coffin, excuse me. You had Lady Halitosis and, uh, and uh, Sky King. Next, please. Next story is about a B-25 that crashed going from Rome back to Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts. A lot of these are weather-related circumstances. Apparently near Ilion, it encountered uh, bad weather, uh, wound up plowing into a, uh, into a, a, a somewhat modest mountain or hill. And as a result, uh, uh, you know, the uh, accident board was sent out from Griffiths, uh, excuse me, Rome, to, uh, to take a look at things that the crash happened at Crane's Corners. Next. Um, we'll just keep going here. This is more of the same on that. <clears throat> there are the actual pictures from the crash site. As you can see, things don't turn out too well when aluminum collides with the ground. Um, and again, unfortunately, everybody was lost in the process. Next. Uh, the 305th uh, group out of uh, which stayed through Syracuse uh, had as its command as its uh, colonel in charge uh, Curtis LeMay. I just kind of put that in there. There is a whole bit of uh, history in Syracuse we'll I'll have to delve a little bit more into in future uh, uh, presentations. Next. And again, these are some shots that I got. Uh, this is after the war, the upper right-hand corner, where some of the planes are mothballed. Next. Um, not everything, or I should say, let me back up here. Ro or Syracuse was used as a training stage, stage for the, uh, <clears throat> for largely transport planes. And a lot of the planes, again, as I mentioned, were sort of uh, otherwise, uh, they, they were worn out. Some of these had funny circumstances, most not. Uh, there were more than one account of uh, planes that went into either Oneida Lake or Lake Ontario. Um, sometimes the pilots were able to swim away. Sometimes they weren't. There's a story of a C-46 uh, that was uh, lost in the Adirondacks. And again, people found it year or so after of the crash. Next. Um, just I'm going to run through this because I know we're getting close. <clears throat> Getaway Gertie, story of a, of a B-24 that uh, was on its way from west over to Rome, overshot, wound up uh, being lost in Lake Ontario. Um, and in fact, they never found, they only found like part of a wing and it's still missing. And there was no, there was no major part of the plane and none of the bodies were ever recovered. Next. And I apologize. There's no way I'm going to be able to read this, but this is a great account. So if you want to go through it and read it on your own, uh, you can do that. Next. There's a little bit about Westover. Keep going. Back in the day, oh, one more, back up if you could. Uh, the one thing I want to point out about this is bottom left, um, Westover was used as a POW location, POW camp location. Next. <coughs> um, keep going. That's just some of the units that were at Westover. All right. Short burst, not the full nine yards. Definition of full nine yards is depending upon uh, who you listen to. Uh, it's either the amount of fabric used uh, to put a kilt or a, bo a body shroud, the length of aircraft, machine gun belts in World War II, uh, cubic yards in a, in a grave or cement truck, and expansive sails on a three-masted schooner. We're going to talk about it short bursts, or not the full nine yards as it pertains to um, the 50 caliber machine guns. So, next. Uh, in the funny category, there's a <laughs> there's an account of a plane that was actually shot at by a pilot. It was on its way from Rome to uh, Pine Camp, 
uh, up north. It was an observation plane, and there's a picture of the type of plane. But the account was that some hunter apparently took a shot at at the observation plane. I don't know why you would shoot at an American plane, but this hunter did. Pilot was only minorly um, was only minorly uh, injured. Next, um, and there's some pictures of uh, Pine Camp and the airfield. And if you see the hangar shot there, there's some planes that they were working on largely in the observation aspect of, uh, <clears throat> of, of use of the plane itself. Keep going. Uh, some other funny stuff. There's a British pilot that was taking training in Canada and got lost and wound up over uh, St. Johnsville area, uh, Gloversville. There's another story of a pilot who very carefully put his plane down in a crops field, made sure he straddled the crops so that uh, it wouldn't ruin uh, his uh, the farmer's uh, crops. Next. Uh, okay. I'll, I will can let, we can let you go on this one. Uh, another bomber crash out in Penyan. Unfortunately, again, a lot of this is weather related, not knowing where they are. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, Constantia, planes lost and people lost in Oneida Lake. Next. Uh, now, I'm going to play a little bit more homage to uh, Gary Panzer. His, he got some information from his father, who was, I believe, a mechanic or ground crew for the 95th Bomb Group. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, a book about their account and, uh, Gary supplied me some very interesting pictures. Keep going. Next. Um, Fred uh, Panzer, Frederick Panzer, and there's some pictures of him in training and various things, group pictures. Next. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Gary, I had to do this. <clears throat> the group, the picture, you can see the group, but it's supposed to be the 200th anniversary or celebration 200 missions. But this picture, I couldn't resist. Oh, keep, go back one. Go back one. <laughs> That's Gary in the center, right there, as a baby. There's his father and his grandmother. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do that, Gary. Okay, next. Very cute. <laughs> uh, these are some other planes that were uh, that various uh, celebrities did. Jimmy Stewart, there's his plane. He was a decorated pilot, group commander. Uh, Clark Gable, uh, Gene Roddenberry. Next. Uh, I always like to put this in, keep them flying. Somebody once told me, why do you care about airplanes uh, and why should they fly? It's because I, I say, if you've ever been, have you, uh, can you imagine going to a museum where all the animals are stuffed instead of going to a zoo where they're alive? That's uh, So if you ever get a chance to support uh, uh, an effort like uh, making things known or promoting with money, that would be great. Next. Uh, this is some pictures that were taken. Uh, I actually spent four days out in California uh, flying on a, a crew B-17 that went through a basic uh, three or four day version of uh, something called bomber camp. Next. And here's some pictures of me when I'm trying to squeeze myself into a ball turret. Uh, practice ball turret and me shooting a 50 cal from the uh, waist gun position on the, the 909, which unfortunately crashed a, a year or so ago. So I thank you for your time and attention. I know we went a little over. I'd be happy to take your questions uh, to the extent that I could answer them. And if you have additional information, I'm always looking for grist for the mill. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn the control over to Miranda, who who will uh, lead us in Q and A. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. That was wonderful. Um, so, everyone, if you have any questions, you can feel free to, or if you want to comment on Jim's program, um, you can unmute yourself, or you can put them in the chat. Um, but I have a question for you, Jim. 
Shoot. I have two questions actually, but the first one's about, you know, the wreckages that you um, alluded to in the cat skills that weren't found until years and years later. Mm -hmm. uh, so do they make an effort to clean that up when it's found or is it, you know, what, how does that work? Well, actually technicality here, Miranda, the plane was not, did not go down in the cat skills. It went down and I'm sorry if I omitted this, it, they found the plane and remnants of the pilot in uh, Forestport, north of Rome. Okay. Well, my my bad. I probably glossed over that, but uh, that's, that's where right. it was. That's where that's where they were actually found. So something must have really gone wrong that he was that far off course that people thought he was uh, <clears throat> that he was where he was uh, or wasn't. I should say. Um, yes, those pictures are current recent years pictures so they must have taken um i would imagine they took the weapons out of the plane and any avionics that they could spare but the carcass of it remained there so and it's unfortunately because you have a lot of planes that are not they're not necessarily discovered because they're in remote places right um so. Another question I had was, um, and I don't know if you have the answer to this, but with advances in aviation and navigation systems, um, are some of these incidents that happened back in the, you know, decades ago, are mm -hmm. those things that nowadays might be avoided if pilots are put in similar situations or is it? Yeah. The short answer is yes. But again, it's a, it's an inherently dangerous occupation. One of the things that I need to follow up with you all at uh, the Rome Historical Society was the crash of a plane that happened in 1955, 10 years after the end of the war, in, of all places, Balkville, which is uh, <clears throat> in southern Madison County. And there's very little uh, uh, in the records uh, about that. And I, I am guessing that it may have been because the plane was attached to a group that was looking at and making uh, technical research in the first version of uh, drones. So it could have been, and the reason why I'm extrapolating that is because <clears throat> there, in one of the news articles I read, there was uh, the fact that the news crews television news crews and photographers were not allowed at the crash site until some restricted materials could be taken from the site. So I'm thinking that it's part of a, was part of a hush hush for that time frame. But interesting, uh, because it's such a complicated thing to do, the advent of checklists actually came as a direct result of pilot <clears throat> Uh, orientation and whatnot. And in fact, the checklist migrated its way to medicine. So that now if you get operated on, the checklist goes right back to the time when the prototype of the B-17 was being developed. And it was such a complicated thing that they, they actually lost one of the prototypes of the plane because they didn't undo something that they should have before they took off. So checklist is, uh, is another uh, thing that we have to thank um, aviation for. I thank aviation for that too, because I use checklists in my daily <laughs> life. Um, a question did come in from Ken. He said, are there any B-17s or B-29s that take people on flights? I yeah, know, there, you know. there are. It's getting to be uh, harder to find them. There are actually... Uh, by my recollection, there are nine or ten flyable B-17s, and I know that a few of them take uh, uh, customers, if you will. One of them is the, uh, the Aeronautic Association's uh, aluminum overcast. Uh, that that you can get typical cost for that is if you're in the fuselage area it's probably four hundred to five hundred dollars if you want to be up in the nose um, it's um, I think it's like eight hundred nine hundred dollars in fact there's a b20 
nine. Uh, but if you're up in the nose, I think it's like fifteen hundred dollars, uh, eight hundred dollars to be in the fuselage. I actually flew the plane I flew on was nine oh nine, which was a Collins Foundation plane, and that unfortunately is no longer. It crashed at Bradley Airfield a number a couple of years ago. They do. There is one flying B twenty four that's also operated by the Collins Foundation. So I would say that it's gotten to be very expensive insurance wise. And these are aging ladies. I mean, you know, we're talking about airframes that are 75 plus years old at this point. So uh, <clears throat> I should look that good <laughs> at 75. So shorter answer is probably three or four. I would recommend that you go uh, first to the uh, the, uh, air, the EAA. And they, I know they fly around. They don't always make it to the Northeast. There's a couple of DC-3s that fly in this area. Um, the um, Whiskey 7 out of Geneseo flies. So if you want a prop experience, that's one way to do it. They used to fly the movie Memphis Bell. That's the B-17 that was used in the making of the movie in 1989. But that has since they came into insurance problems and costs and things like that. And that's gone on the West Coast. So there's a couple of things for you to check out. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, if anyone has any further questions, that's Jim's email up there. Um, and we'll also put it um, kind of in the comments so people can click it. And I'm sure, Jim, you would be happy to answer people's questions and talk to them more about all of this. Stuff. Definitely. Definitely. Give me some okay. stuff to give me some <laughs> stuff to, to research. All right. Well, everyone, for now, uh, have a good rest of your night and thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Jim. That was wonderful. Um, have a thank good night. Everyone. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.